today let's uh, i just want to i just want to look at um, jabez today and uh, uh, James tells us that you don't receive because you don't ask. You have not because you ask not. So there are certain things that are not working out in our life because we are not asking. Yeah. And um, I believe that uh, one of the most things important about prayer is learning to touch the heart of God, using prayer as a vehicle to touch the heart of God. You touch his heart, he can move the mountains that need to be moved in his time. He has a timing, but we have to learn to touch his heart. Uh, I believe that even even um, even among friends, you know, uh, if you really want your friends to love you and 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 uh, stand with you, uh, we really need to honor them, love them, value them, cherish them, and learn to touch their heart. If you touch the heart of a friend, he'll do for you what he'll never do otherwise. <laughs> a father will do for his child, you know. Something extraordinary. The child learns to touch the heart of the father or the mother. Though we love our kids so much, but there's still something special about a kid learning to touch the heart of the parents. And so we really, we really need to learn to touch the heart of God. So today I'm going to give you two examples of guys who, who, had found a way. They they touched the heart of God and they got something incredible, because they were touching the heart of God. And uh, and also it, it ties in with what James says that if you don't ask, you don't get. So he said. So James says that you don't ask certain things because you never, you don't get certain things because you never ask. So you don't get. And then he says you ask and you still don't get because you ask for your own selfish, selfish reasons, selfish ambitions, your selfish reasons. And so you don't get it. Yeah. But if we were to ask as per the will of God, if we were to ask as per the revealed will, the revealed will of God, why will God not hear us? Yeah. Also, many people think that prayer is a substitute for obedience. No, uh, prayer aids obedience, but prayer is no substitute for obedience. If it's effective prayer, it should empower your obedience, but it is no substitute for obedience. So, so you know, you could be someone praying ten hours a day and thinking great about it, but then if you're not living out a life of obedience to the Scripture, there's something wrong in the way you pray. Prayer is supposed to empower obedience to God. But it, but if all your praying is not resulting in obedience, there's something really wrong in your communion life. So let's look at this guy. This guy called Jabez. Yeah, it's a very, it's interesting. It's a very short, short uh, few lines about him in the Bible. But there's something important we can learn from this guy about prayer. The one of the most important things we learn from this guy is ask, because God is. Compassion, I don't hold back. Ask, yeah. And um, we have these uh, famous verses also. Um, can we just go to Matthew seven seven, please? Where we're encouraged to ask. Ask and keep asking, and knock and keep knocking. And can we go? Can we do? Can we go there, please, Naveen? Uh, Matthew seven seven. Okay. Ask and it will be given to you. Now, in the original language, this is in the continual tense. So it is ask and keep asking and it will be given to you. Seek and keep seeking and you will find. Knock and keep knocking and it will be open, open to you. And, and so God encourages us. Ask. Ask things on my heart. For you, for your family, for your children, for your city, for your nation. Yeah, the many things on my heart for you, ask for them. Ask, and you will receive. And it's in continual tense. So he's saying, don't give up, don't get discouraged if, it's, if it didn't happen the first time you asked. Ask and keep asking. Knock and keep knocking. Seek and keep seeking. And so, so let's go to Jabez, please. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. His asking changed his whole life. He had a miserable existence. This boy had a miserable existence. And his asking just had a dynamic effect on his, on his whole life. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him with pain. Imagine your name is pain. So you introduce yourself 
I am pain malik. So the guy is like, don't pass your pain to me, man. <laughs> like, it defines you in such a sad way. So this fellow's name is pain. So when he introduces himself, he says, hi guys, I am pain. Yeah, Jabez is, means pain. And uh, the mother gave him the name because the mother had so much pain in childbirth, the mother, that's called pain only. So, uh, pain in the neck. Yeah. <laughs> it's pain. So, the name is pain. Even when our names are nice and sweet, in school people still twist our name and make fun of it, right? <laughs> Imagine this poor fellow, what he must have gone through. Pain is here, pain is there, pain is here, pain has gone there. Oh ma'am, pain is giving you pain. <laughs> oh mummy, this fellow is such a pain. Yeah, the brothers also will be pulling his leg. Now, not, not clearly, Jabez is not happy about this. I don't know who will be happy to have a name like pain. <laughs> so the Bible tells that Jabez is pretty disturbed about this situation. But he does something which God likes. He, he calls out to God. He doesn't, he doesn't sleep on it. He doesn't say, okay, let it be. Now, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. I really need some blessing. <laughs> my name has just taken over my identity. Yeah. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my border. And that your hand might be with me. And that you would keep me from harm then it may not pain me. And God granted him his request. Wow. Imagine if he wouldn't have prayed. He would have been miserable all his life. He would have let that name define him all his life. He would have lived in the reality of that state all his life. And he would have been ended up a loser all his life. And... But his reaching out to God, because he was convinced that the God of Israel is God of compassion. Hallelujah. Are you convinced that God is God of compassion? Yes, yes. Why would we call out to God for help, for mercy? If you're not even convinced, he's compassionate and kind. You know, it's I find many times when I when I when I spend time with, with believers as as a, as a shepherd, I find many times that um, Outwardly, everyone says great things about God. But when things hit people, I find many believers are very much affected by fear. So there are a lot of crazy thoughts about God when the rubber hits the road. And that's, that, can, that can really hit your life. Yeah. What do you think about God deep inside? Do you really think He's kind? Do you really think He's gracious? Or you think He's this mean, mean person? Or I don't know who He is. You know. But outwardly, God is great. Inwardly, man, I don't know, man, this God is unpredictable, this God can do anything. Yeah. You know, we can't be in that state. There has to be something solid in us about the character of God. We got to be convinced, man, this is a gracious God. This is a compassionate God. This God is, a, uh, He loves with unfailing love because now I have put my faith in Jesus. I'm accepted. I'm accepted in the beloved. There has to be that assurance that I am loved. That this is a gracious God. This is a kind God. We can't be internally suffering with lack of assurance. Why would I call out to a God when I'm wondering, is really that good? <laughs> Does he really care? I think God is unpredictable. You know, when we have all this nonsense inside, we can't pray, man. We can't pray effectively. This guy was convinced that... My life is a mess, but he was convinced this God is a God of compassion. He will have compassion on me if I cry out to him. Hallelujah. Are you convinced that Christ is full of compassion? Because if you are, you will cry out to him. When things begin to eat away at your life, you will cry out to him from the heart. So here is a man who is convinced that this God is real, has got a compassion. And he says, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my border. And that your hand might be with me. And that you would keep me from harm. That it may not pain me. And it's amazing. God grants him his request. If he would not have asked. Precious ones. All his life he would have lived in pain and sorrow. And the life of a loser. So what James says is very important. There are certain things that are not working out in your life. Because you are not asking for them. 
You're not asking for them. You're not asking for them. My father asked me an interesting question recently. He said, he said, I have never heard anyone say that prayer is about touching the heart of God. And he said, how does one become a man who, a man after God's heart? What does it mean, a man after God's own heart? Now, the first thing is, if you want to be a man or woman God after God's own heart, we should ask and start praying about it. Lord, raise me up as a man, raise me up as a woman after your own heart, who will fulfill all of your will in my generation. Why aren't we praying such things? If we don't ask, we aren't getting it. And so who is a person after God's heart? Someone who by the grace of God is growing in caring more about God's heart than your own heart. That's very challenging, but then the grace of God can make it happen. <laughs> Every time we have to take an important decision, we need to ask. Study the word. Speak to seniors. Say, what would please the heart of God in this decision? You know, there are, there are many things that please us. But what about what would please God in this decision of mine? And then, when you know what to please God, humbling ourselves and asking for grace and strength and doing it, even if it's not so pleasant. Even if it's not so pleasant. And so, in our journey with God, it's not just about learning how to live, it's also about learning how to die to self. If you want to grow in the Lord, it's not just about learning how to live, it's also about learning how to die to self. Carrying our cross. And God told us that if you want to follow me, you need to carry your cross. So, if we, don't, if we don't even pray things like this, how are we going to become those people? Lord, I want to be a man after your own heart. Make me a man after your own heart. Who will fulfill all of your will in my generation. I want to be that man. Lord, make me a man who cares more about your heart than my own heart. Where the rubber hits the road. If you're not going to ask, that's going to happen. This man asked. And let's see what he asked. All right? He asked a couple of things. Let's go there, please. So first thing he says is, bless me indeed. Wow. The blessing of God swallows up curse. The blessing of God swallows up curse. The reason a born-again believer cannot be cursed is because already every spiritual blessing has been put into your account. Proverbs says, a curse cannot alight without a cause. Every cause, every reason, because of which a curse could come upon a human being, Christ has dealt with it on the cross. So when we put our faith in Christ, we cannot be cursed. And blessing swallows up curse. So he's a smart guy. He's asking a very smart thing here. <laughs> he says, I've, I, I've had enough of the curse problem. I need, if you bless me, I know curses can't touch me. Hallelujah. Now for us, we need to tweak this a little bit. Precious ones, I say this to you. Whenever you work, we must use the prayers of the Old Testament. But when we use them, sometimes we might have to relook them in light of the gospel, in light of the cross, in light of the cross. So, so now we are already blessed people. So what do we need? Lord, I want to thank you for every spiritual blessing. Now, thank you. Every spiritual blessing is put into my account. Now give me grace and strength to take steps of faith and steps of obedience so that what is in my account can come into my possession. So our, our prayers get a little changed. Then this guy, but there's value. And then he says, enlarge my border. Wow. If we don't ask God to enlarge our border, how will they get enlarged? Yeah. One thing I know for sure that one reason our brother Titus, his business has grown a lot is because I know he prays this. I know that. He, I know that. I know that and I know that. That expand my territory. Because I've known him for 15 years or how many years? 20 years. And I know he prays these kind of things. That's why his business is really booming, man. It would not happen if he was not humbling and asking God and saying, Lord, expand my business. Expand my territory. You, you ask. You humble and ask. And you expect. And why will not God? Do it. Why will not God 
Do it. Oh, precious one, what stops you from saying? Lord, enlarge my influence in the corporate sector. You work in the corporate sector, most of you. Why can't you say, enlarge my influence in the corporate sector? For what? Not that I become a great guy. Enlarge my influence so that I can be more effective for kingdom purposes. Why can't we pray that? You don't pray, you don't get. Enlarge my influence, Lord. Enlarge my influence. I pray, enlarge my influence in the ministry for kingdom purposes. I want more influence for what? For more of the kingdom purposes to flourish through me and the church. Yeah. We want greater influence for good. Influence is a good thing. If influence is not abused, it's a great thing. Hallelujah. What is leadership? Leadership is influence. You don't need a title to be a leader. If you can influence people for God, you're a leader. Leadership is what? Influence. If you can influence people, you're a leader. There are bad leaders and there are good leaders. <laughs> now the important thing is we would be godly leaders. So we must ask, increase my influence, Lord, for kingdom purposes. Increase my influence for kingdom purposes. What stops us? You don't ask, you don't get. So that's a smart thing to do. Even yesterday when we were blessing these guys at the end of the picnic, what did we pray? One of the things I prayed for them was what? Expand their business. Lord, expand their business. We pray for this, this hotel people. Bless them, Lord. Expand their business. You know, when I pray for you guys, one thing that I pray for you guys is I bless the organizations where you work. And I say, Lord, we bless these organizations where these guys work. Expand the businesses. Expand, give them projects. Let them expand. Let them grow. Let them prosper. Yeah? And then he says, and then he says that your right hand might be with me. The right hand of favor may abound Upon me. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a good thing. Lord, and for us, Lord, you said, you surround the righteous with favor as with a shield. Yeah, I thank you for the shield of favor. I thank you, Lord, that I am highly blessed and favored in Christ. Now let, let, it, let it manifest. Let it manifest as we go out today. I want to taste. I want, I want, I want to taste. I expect distinguishing favor wherever I go because it is my portion. There was a, there was a, there's an there's old lady I met some years back. Every morning, she starts her day by saying, Lord, I expect tremendous favor wherever I go today. Because you said, you surround the righteous, righteous with favor as with a shield. I am righteous not with the good works. I am righteous because of my faith in Christ. So today, as I step out of this house, I'm expecting distinguishing favor wherever I go. Hallelujah. You don't ask, you don't get. You ask, you get. And then he says, that you would keep me from harm, that it may not pain me. We live in a world that is fractured by sin, a world that is broken by sin. And bad things happen here. So we can pray. Lord, protect us from pain because of the evil in the world. Protect us from pain, suffering, because of the evil in the world. We can pray that. He prayed. Yep. And then, so four things he has prayed. And then, it's amazing, huh? God grants him his request. His life changes forever. Something so defining has happened to him. If he would not have prayed, he would have been miserable all his life. And he would have let that name define him. Define his destiny. Yep. Okay. Let's look at one more guy. Another interesting character. Hezekiah. 2 Kings 19 we are told that Hezekiah has a great victory. He's been threatened by Sennacherib and the Sennacherib guy is, a, is, is really violent, is wicked. He's, he's doing all kind of propaganda to dishearten Hezekiah and his people. In fact, he's even telling, telling he's, he's on the language, in the language the people understand, Judean, He's sending people to the wall and, 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 making, and, and making the guys speak in that language. Don't let this Hezekiah deceive you. This Hezekiah cannot help you. No king, no god of the countries I have defeated could help them. Don't let this Hezekiah deceive you. He can't help you. Your god can't help you. So this guy was really wicked. He was really wicked. He was good at propaganda. 
and he was also strong and 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 wicked. Now, and, and what do we find? What did what did this guy Hezekiah do? He was up against the most powerful, the most cruel guy in the world at that time. And this fellow was strong, wicked, and full of propaganda. So what did Hezekiah do? We told two things. One, he strengthened his people with regards to the promise, the covenant promises. One, he prayed. Second, he encouraged them. He strengthened them about covenant promises. Yeah. So what did he pray? And and I'm just I'm just tying this. And eventually, I want to go to the prayer of Hezekiah when he was told he's going to die by God Himself, and then he lived. So let's let's just go to two Chronicles 19 for a moment. Quickly, please. So two Chronicles and uh, two Chronicles 19 and. So, Hezekiah has got these threatening letters from Sennacherib and he's now praying uh, and praying out to God. You don't, you don't, you, ha you don't have because you don't ask. So, 2 Kings 19.14 please, Navi. He could have chickened out, he could have got afraid because the fact is, Sennacherib was this undefeated champion. <laughs> like, you know, we have in boxing, there are certain guys who are undefeated. Yeah, we said this is the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. He's never lost anybody. So the Senegare was pretty deadly. He had not lost anybody. <laughs> okay? And he was pretty powerful. He's a really powerful guy. Now this guy got chickened out and said, Boss, we will be under you. No, what did he do? He prayed. Hallelujah. So he took the threatening letters from the hands of the messengers and read it. And what did he do after he read all the threatening letters? You know, we also get threatening letters. Sometimes our threatening letter could be the report from the doctor. You're going to die in one month. <laughs> it's a threatening letter. Someone might call it a report. I call it a threatening letter. Sometimes it could be from your boss. Okay, two month notice. Threatening letter. <laughs> or a verbal threat. Pull up your socks, man, or three months, you're out. Threat, yeah? What, did, what do we do with threats? Precious ones. Are we going to chicken out it in front of threats? Or we'll do something with the threats? We all are threatened some point of time, right? I remember when I was, when I was in final year, I was threatened by the biggest gunda in college. I will kill you, bury you here itself. No one will know. And his problem was that I was sharing the gospel and somehow always his party gundas were getting saved. So he thought I am the opposition party mega, mega strategist who is great at brainwashing everybody of his party. Yeah. And all I was doing was I was just loving people, telling them the gospel. And somehow it was always the most notorious guys getting saved in the college. Praise God for the power of the gospel. The most notorious people give their life to Christ. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Hallelujah. And sometimes, you know, the, the guys we think, the sweet, dignified ones, sometimes they never turn to Christ. But I found so many, so many. Gundas turn to Christ. It's just amazing. The power of Christ is amazing. Hallelujah. Some of the most, some of the, some of the most what we call scum of the earth, turn to Christ. It's just amazing, man. Hallelujah. But the fact, it was a threat. And actually, he could have done this, and nothing could have been done also. He really meant his threat. And he could have done it, and there's really nothing that could have been done. So, you know, he wasn't joking around with me. But then, uh, we have a greater reality we live by. Hallelujah. And I heard so clearly the Holy Spirit say to me, I am with you. And I said this guy, I said, you are no match for my Jesus Christ. Interesting answer to a to guy who wants to kill you. And this fellow, he just looked at me and says, You're a madman. And he just walked away. <laughs> so here is a guy saying, I want to kill you, bury you, finished. I just shouted him back and I said, You're no match for my Jesus Christ. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he said, You're a madman. Walks away. He never ever troubled me. We live from a greater reality, precious ones. The biggest bully, Sennacherib of his time, was bullying, was trying to bully whom? Hezekiah. What did Hezekiah do? 
He didn't chicken out. He cried out to God. Hallelujah. What happened? What happened? Let's please see his prayer, please. 2 Kings 19. Okay. Now, now look at this. He starts praying. Oh Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. He said, you're the sovereign one. You rule over every king. You have made heaven and earth. You're not just a tribal God. You are the, the God of the heavens. The one who made the heaven and the earth. You're, you're, you're really amazingly mighty. Hallelujah. Then, incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and listen to the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O oh Lord, the king of Assyria has devastated the nations and the lands. It's due to the fact. The king of Assyria was wicked. He was deadly. He was the undefeated champion of his time. <laughs> he was going around messing up nations. He was no weakling. He, this fellow was strong. The guy who threatened me that day in college, he was someone who could actually kill me and gotten away with it easily. So, so, so sometimes we face real stuff. It's not okay, you know, just to show him, we'll say him, no. This fellow really meant it. He really, he really wanted to destroy these guys if they don't submit. And look at this. And he said, and he said, God, he is right. He has devastated nations. He has cast their gods into the fire. But then they were not gods. They were works of man's hands. And they were nothing but work of man's hands, wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. And so this guy, he was telling Hezekiah and his people, Every nation, any nation that I want to conquer, I can conquer. And I have. And I have destroyed their gods. So who are you and who is your god? So he's saying, Lord, it is correct. This fellow has destroyed many nations and he has destroyed their gods. But their gods are not like you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then, now Lord God, I pray, deliver us from his hand. That all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said to you, God loves to answer prayers where he is glorified. God loves to answer prayers where he is glorified. Hallelujah. So he's saying, Lord, we are no match for this guy. But this guy is no match for you. Now, defeat him and show to the whole world there is no, no God like you in all the earth. Hallelujah. And when God does this, who gets the glory? Yahweh gets the glory. Hallelujah. God Almighty gets the glory because everybody knows Israel is no match for Assyria, but God. Hallelujah. So when they win, it's very clear the God Israel is mighty. Hallelujah. So he's saying, Lord, answer this prayer so that your name is lifted up in all the earth. Hallelujah. If our prayers, if, the, if God would answer them and it would lift up his name, God will answer them. Let's pray prayers where if the answer came, he would be glorified. Many times we make prayers, but the answer came, we are lifted up. Now, he doesn't like that. Yeah. And so we know what happened. God sends an angel and the angel kills 1,85,000 of the army. One angel killed 1,85,000 people of this army of Seneca. Just one angel. And this guy got so scared they ran off. And even this fellow got killed by his own children, it says. So, yeah, so they, so if you read, if you, if you continue to read, read, you will see how God responded to his prayer. And then what happens is that this great victory, God answered this amazing prayer. And, and then, 2 Kings 20, please. And that's where I, where I want to end with. And that's what I wanted to bring you to eventually. 20, verse 1, maybe. Now, now, here is a guy who loves God, has seen a phenomenal victory over the most powerful tyrant in the world. Yeah? And then what happens? Hezekiah becomes mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, the great Isaiah the prophet, from whom we got Isaiah 53, where we have this great prophecy about the cross, comes and says to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now this is serious. 
It's more serious than when the doctor tells us you're going to die. <laughs> because God himself is saying you're going to die. This, this, is, this is serious stuff, man. If the doctor said you're going to die, you know, <laughs> some of us would still have the faith to, ah, I'm going to make it, man, through God. <laughs> but if God himself says, British, Time to pack up, buddy. I want to see you more, more, more up close, man. British is like, I want to live. But then, but then he just might keep crying and stop it there, you know. But this fellow, he, what does he do? God Almighty has sent you a bad report. As a guy, you want to die? Set your house in order, good boy. I need you. Most of us would have taken it as a lot in life and said, who can, you know, most of us said, who can wrestle with the arm of the Almighty? Who can wrestle with you, God? Or help my wife, help my children when I'm gone. And that's where we would stop. But what did this guy do? Please, please see what this guy does. He turned his face to the wall. It's like, he's like, I'm not, I'm just going to focus my whole attention and I'm going to cry out and commune. So he turns his face to the wall. It's, it's a sign of, I'm going to take my whole, I'm going to focus entirely on the Lord and come on my commune with God. And he prays to God. What does he pray? Let's see. Remember now, O Lord. I beseech you, I beg you, remember how I walked with you in truth and with the whole heart and I have done what is good in your sight. And then Hezekiah wept bitterly. Most of us would weep bitterly but not pray this prayer. We'll be so convinced. Story is over. And then even if Hutovi says, Ore picture abhi baki abhai, we'll say no. <laughs> God said it this time, man. It's finished. Hmm? It's over. But this fellow, before he weeps bitterly, he still cries out to God. It's amazing. Yeah? It's, it's astounding. I find it amazing. This guy would do this. If we're honest, most of us would have wept bitterly and stopped it there. But this guy is different. Remember, Lord, I beseech you. Remember, I beg you, remember. Remember how I walk before you in truth and with the whole heart. And I've done what is good in your sight. Remember. And he weeps bitterly. Now, guys, we need to change this a little bit when we pray this. <laughs> because after the cross, it pays to come with the merit of Christ, not your own merit. Yeah. So if you're in this situation, yeah, it's better to say, Lord, Remember the work of your son Jesus on the cross. Remember the excellencies of this Jesus who has died for me on the cross. Remember and grant me health which is my portion. Hallelujah. Amen. So our prayer should change after the cross. But we should pray nevertheless. In fact, we, have, we should have far greater confidence than Hezekiah because we are coming the merit of Christ himself. Yes. Hallelujah. And then what happens? What does God do? It's amazing, man. Before Isaiah had even gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord comes to him. So, so here is, so here is, I'm Isaiah. So I tell this guy, you want to die, put your house in order. Bye. And I'm here, and the, and the Lord says, go back. Okay. Now, it's not pleasant, right? If you're a prophet, if you have to change your, change your prophecy. I think you lose face, isn't it? You're going to die, and this fellow is living. The elders of the church will throw me out. And they say, false prophet, false prophet, out. Right? So, so this is not pleasant. Now, God is saying, as I go back, uh, as I go back, go back, go back, go back. And it's been interesting. Isaiah has not even left the palace. And God is so moved. Here is a man who has so touched God's heart. God is so affected. Isaiah has not even left the palace. God is so quickly saying, go, go back, go back, come on. And then what does he say? Return, Isaiah. Say 
to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David. Interesting. Covenant language. God is saying, yeah, I remember covenant, yeah. I have heard your prayer. Can you say this? Can you please read this with me? I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. You know, many times we wonder, does God even hear my prayers? We wonder, does God even see my tears? Oh, precious ones, He hears our prayers, He sees our tears, He's so concerned about us. We are so precious to Him. And then He says, on the third day, I will heal you, and then, and then on the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord. And we are told that He recovers. And, and, but really, what's amazing for me is, in the most impossible situation, a man touches the heart of God yes. and gets 15 more years added to his life. It's extraordinary. God says what? I'll add? Can you, can you, I think the next verse says about 15 years. I will add 15 years to your life. God is so gracious. Yeah. He's, he's not like us. You know, if I was God, I would say, Chai is crying so much. Okay. One year, boy. <laughs> Go live your life in this one year. But God is not like us. God is lavish. Okay, 15 years. I've seen your tears. Go take 15 years. Hallelujah. That's how amazing, generous God is. God is extravagant in His love to us. God is extravagant in His love towards us. Can you say that? God is extravagant. In his love towards us. God is extravagant in his dealings with his people. God is extravagant in his dealing with us. And that's, you know, the psalmist said, Lord, you have dealt bountifully with me. Hallelujah. God didn't have to bribe him to say that. Are, are everybody's cursing me. Do you say something? No, no. The psalmist was, had so tasted the bounty of God. He said, God, you have dealt bountifully with me. I believe one reason we believers are not extravagant many times in our giving, time, money, resources to God is because we are not tasting the extravagance of God. Yes. And that's why we are also stingy in our dealings with other people. The more we taste the extravagance of God, the more we will become generous to people. Generous in attitude, generous in heart. Generous in our treatment to them, generous in forgiveness, generous in giving, generous. We become generous. This is a very generous God we're dealing with. He's extravagant in his dealing with his people. But one reason we can be so stingy many times in dealing with people is because we are not tasting the extravagance of God. He's extravagant. He is extravagant, He is generous in dealings with you and me. If we are not being generous and kind and gracious to people, it's because we are not tasting the extravagance of God. You know, we sometimes wonder, you know, we, we hear stories of how there are people who give 50% of their salary to God, 80% of their salary to God. How do you think they do that? <laughs> you see, they keep tasting this extravagant God and they are empowered to do that, isn't it? We see people who are so forgiving and we're like, how come this fellow keeps forgiving? They have tasted the richness of forgiveness in Christ. So it's easy to forgive others. Hallelujah. We can only give to people what we have first tasted from God. Hallelujah. If we have tasted richness of forgiveness from God, we'll be rich in forgiveness to people. If we have tasted so much generosity from God, we'll be generous with people. If we have tasted... God favoring us, God not giving us what we deserve, but God favoring us, we will not give people what they deserve. We will favor them. We will, we will treat them in a manner they don't deserve. And we will surprise them with that dealing. Hallelujah. 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 So, I showed you two instances today. If these guys would not have asked, they wouldn't have got. For one guy, Jabez, his life would have been a living hell. The other guy, he would have died when he got that sickness. And both the guys, they, when they cried out to God, 
they got because they asked. And James says, if you don't ask, you don't get. And he says, you also, when you ask, also you don't get because you ask for the wrong motives. You ask for your personal indulgences. You do not ask for the right motives. So precious ones, I, I say this to you. The effective prayers of the righteous accomplish much. Can you say that? The effective prayer of the righteous accomplish much. Let's say that again. The effective prayer of the righteous accomplish much. We saw God's, God sent a report to Hezekiah. God sent a prophet to Hezekiah. You're going to die, put your house in order. Hezekiah cried out to God. God changed his mind. He gave him 15 more years. Hallelujah. 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 And we can get scared by the reports of doctors. So let's take those reports to God. So it's very precious we can learn from Hezekiah. When he was, when, when he was sent letters by Seneca, letters threatening or dire consequences, we just read, he put them before God. He wept in the presence of God. When we were six years into marriage, we were given a written document by the guy who does scans. What do you call the guy who does scans? What, what do you call the doctor who does scans? Radiologist. So, so the radiologist, one of the most famous radiologists in the city, gave us a written document which said, you can never have children. So we took that paper. I wept in the presence of God. I remember, I, I remember vividly that day. I was so pained by the whole situation. I went home. I was reminded of what Hezekiah did by the Holy Spirit. And I, and I knelt before my bed and I, and I took out the report and I said, Lord, see this report. And I, and I reject this. Because you say children are a gift from you. And I praise God that you're kind and gracious and merciful. And today we have three children. Hallelujah. Amen. And when we went, and when, when Vasu was pregnant and we went back to the same guy, he was like, this can't happen. And then when we said, God, don't talk about God with me. Don't talk about God with me. He got so animated. <laughs> but he couldn't deny the reality. Because he had given us a written report, you can never have children. And then he was so upset when he saw that she was pregnant. Because God proved him wrong. It hurts to be proven wrong by God. Hallelujah. Praise God every time. We are also proven wrong by God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's, let, let's spend some time speaking to the Lord, precious ones.